a lot of salespeople are very uh, relationship driven. They they yeah. build relationships. They like getting out and being with customers, whatever you, you know, what, whatever their scenario might be. They enjoy the face to face. And it has been uh, difficult for people. And yet what's really interesting is you can still build a great relationship virtually if you are focusing on those. Welcome to Sales Bites. I'm Abby White. Today we have the most phenomenal guest with us, Sue Langley. Sue is the CEO of Langley Group and just to be honest, one of the most impressive individuals I have ever met. I have done what feels like pretty much all of Langley Group's courses because I am so in love with them and the work that they do. So let me tell you a little bit about Sue and the Langley Group before we dive into the conversation. So Sue is a keynote speaker. Um, She's sought after globally. She's a global consultant and positive leadership expert. She specializes in the practical applications of neuroscience, emotional intelligence, and positive psychology. She is synthesizing the science and research into simple and practical tools that anyone can use. And having done their diploma in positive psychology, having done their Mesquite emotional intelligence um, certifications, I can absolutely vouch for this, that I think one of their superpowers is taking topics that are quite complex and making them simple and practical so that we can all implement them. So you're going to be hearing a lot about that in today's conversation to make it highly, highly practical. Um, So you can walk away with a lot of top tips today. Um, Final part of Sue's bio, as the CEO and founder of the Langley Group, she has worked with thousands of business leaders, coaches, consultants on how to create positive work cultures and harness the brain's potential. As an academic director of the Langley Group Institute, Sue created the world's first nationally recognized diploma in positive psychology and well-being, which I have done and it is absolutely phenomenal. Honestly, I cannot think of anyone that I am more excited to bring to you. Now, with that, let's kickstart into the conversation and welcome Sue. So I want to tap into that point around, because I agree, around well-being is no longer just obviously let's tick the box. You know, we said a couple of positive things. We put some great quotes on the wall. I mean, I like the quotes on the wall, but, but it's kind of so much more than that now. And that's actually a really interesting point, because when I did my diploma in positive psychology with Langley Group, which I absolutely loved, I I still refer back to my homework years on. I'll still go and look back at it and go, God, I forgot about that. How can I um, embed that again? That was so good. Why did I ever fall off the wagon with it? So I revisit it loads. Um, And I want to talk about that because when I did it, I remember several people saying to me, oh, you depressed because I was going to (laughs) do diploma in positive psychology. Uh, or I was joining the happy and clappy club. So I kind of want to talk about this because obviously you specialize in in positive psychology for organizations. So I want to tap into a couple lenses of that and I'll see where, where you take us on this around some of the benefits of why organizations should be doing it, what it really is versus Mm -hmm. what it isn't and how we go about it. Huge question in that. Probably talk for five hours. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think it's a really important question because one of the ways I can always tell how much people know about positive psychology is how they describe it. So when people say it's about being happy all the time, it's like, yeah, you have no idea. Um, because it's not. Um, positive psychology, and, and I always think emotional intelligence and positive psychology sort of go together. Because if you think about positive psychology is about mental health, flourishing, well-being. It's about helping educate ourselves around the tools and techniques that can help us flourish even through adversity. And this is where I think some people misunderstand it. They think it's about being happy all the time. They think it's about um, being joyous and using my strengths all the time and all, all is going well. I always ha- I've had this saying for many years, positive psychology, wonderful on the good day, essential on the bad. Because it's on the bad days, it's on the challenging days, we need these tools in our toolkit. So I think that is a really important thing is positive psychology is how do I put these tools in my toolkit to handle my emotions, to look after myself, to bring more engagement to what I do, to bring more meaning to what I do. So when I'm having a bad day, I've got the tools that I can deal with it. And we've seen this through COVID. People who are able to use those tools of high quality connections, of using their strengths, of practicing gratitude, they're still having bad days. They're still experiencing adversity, yet they're able to thrive and flourish. So I think that's really important for organizations to 
um, if you are going to do this, to teach it to people. You just said about the diploma and, and your homework, if you like. One of the reasons that I love the diploma is because everybody has assignments to do. And in those assignments, you have to go and apply the science. And that's how we learn. And I think that's one of the challenges for organizations is if we're taking this more seriously, Let's actually increase the education, the learning and the practical application. It's all well and good going on a you know one hour webinar on some tools and strategies. But if you don't actually practice them, it's the kind of you know it, do you do it? Many people go, yeah, I know that. But if you're not doing it every day, and to your point, even if you do know it, you sometimes fall off the wagon and stop doing it. So you need another kick up the bottom to remind ourselves. And, and it can change lives when people actually learn this stuff and embed it. Um, I had a message over the weekend, sorry, just a personal example. Um, random message on Saturday while I was having breakfast. I was in Hobart with my parents. And um, over breakfast, I got a message saying, hello, beautiful human being. Um, my father is my father's life is about to end and thanks to you I'm handling it and we bounced back and forward and it was lovely because positive psychology isn't about her father never dying positive psychology is her father is going to pass away she's in a different country and she's at peace because she's done all the things that she needs to do and she's able to handle it and that for me is what positive psychology and well-being is um, and I hope more organizations will take it seriously and I hope people will get educated because to your point there's so many now well-being coordinators and well-being things you know being brought to life um, and I would like to see people whether they've got a diploma through us or a master's through somewhere else actually having the qualifications to be able to bring that content and that information to life. You know, as humans, we're not always the best with with change. Um, and so I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about that, of your approach and, and sort of recommendations around how we approach and embrace change. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting one because um, if you, I'll start with the sales aspect, if I may, because um, I always think I am terrible at selling. I don't, I don't sell. Um, and people go, oh, but you're really good at it. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. What I am really good at is doing what I do really well that you want to buy me. Um, as in you want to buy what we do because yeah. we, we do, uh, we deliver a, a credible product, a reliable product, a good product, if you like, or service or whatever you want to call it. So I think for me, that's the way I've always approached things. If I give my best in a situation and I genuinely am there because I really want people to um, feel the difference, whatever it is, whatever product you might be selling, I think it's really important that you have that sense of you are doing what you're doing for the other person. That's just me. I appreciate other people are maybe got competitive as a strength and they just want to hit a target. I don't know. So I think to your point then around the change, one of the things I have seen is a lot of salespeople are very uh, relationship driven. They they build relationships. They like getting out and being with customers, whatever you, you know, what, whatever their scenario might be. They enjoy the face to face. And it has been uh, difficult for people. And yet what's really interesting is you can still build a great relationship virtually if you are focusing on those strengths of how do you build that relationship. And again, it's just adapting your scenario, if you like, your situation. And yet we shouldn't be throwing out these skills and going, oh, I can't do face to face anymore. Well, no. And somebody, um, Robert Bizwastina, who uh, you know from the positive psychology realm, he and I were chatting early on in um, uh, COVID sort of hitting and everybody going virtual. And he actually said, he said, if you're a terrible teacher virtually, you're probably a terrible teacher face to face. And, and I think that's probably a little bit harsh, but it's a bit like if, you, if you're really good at what you do, whether it's selling or facilitation or whatever you you can adapt your medium. You're still doing the same things. There's still a wonderful human being on the end of it that you're trying to build a relationship with. And guess what? From a sales perspective, if I trust you, I will buy from you. So I think we need to be careful that with the change, we don't assume everything has to change. We can still yeah. use some of these brilliant skills and strengths that we have. It's just adapting it to a different medium. And it worries me when I see things um, from a, a news and a media perspective of you can't do this and this isn't working and, you know, Zoom is bad and blah, 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 and we hear all this sort of stuff. And somebody actually posted today, once again, the um, research study from nearly two years ago now um, of your brain on four meetings on Zoom. 
And I just think this is hilarious that people are still posting this. There were 14 people involved in the study, not a huge number. They all had electrodes stuck on their head while they're doing Zoom. Well, who is going to have electrodes on their head when they're face to face? Nobody. So we've got no contrast of four meetings in a row on Zoom compared to four meetings in a row face to face. It's probably exactly the same, but nobody's prepared to sit with electrodes stuck all over them face to face. So, of course, they probably didn't have their camera on, which means our results are completely um, sort of influenced by different variables. So I think we need to be careful of buying into the fact that this change that's happened is bad because the people that I've seen who've really been able to run with it have used this change to, to help them. One more thing on this I will mention is we know from a neuroscience perspective that some people are more tolerant to change than others, but generally speaking, the brain doesn't like uncertainty. So if you think about what the brain is, it's a prediction machine. It likes to predict things. So when things play out as you predict, it's great. The brain's happy, et cetera. Uh, when it plays out like it doesn't predict, it's like, Whoa. and we know that even simple things of change of, I don't know, your email or something, all of a sudden they've moved the send button to a different spot and you're like, ooh, because it hasn't predicted where it was meant to be. It predicted it in one place and it's moved. So from that perspective, brains probably have a little bit of a challenge around change because it likes to predict. And yet again, if you think about how people um, have succeeded through different change, it's being curious, it's embracing, it's looking for ways of doing things better. It's saying, okay, well, how does this help me? And it is about adaptation. And again, if you look at some of the research um, around stress, which is a big thing right now, the perception of stress completely changes your um, the neurotransmitters that you release, et cetera, in your brain. So if you think stress is good and should be embraced and could be helpful, you produce more of a particular chemical that helps you learn and increase memory retention. If you think stress is harmful and should be avoided, you produce less of that. Well, think about that for a moment. If I can flip my thinking and go, what can I learn from this? How can I use this, et cetera? I'm automatically then producing more chemicals that is enabling me to learn and grow and shift. Whereas if I'm going, oh my God, this is terrible, this is terrible, I'm not producing what I need to do anything with it, which means every time it hits me, it's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible, and then I can't cope. So I think it's just about, it's not as simple as changing your perception, but it's looking for being curious, what could I do with this? And yeah, adversity is going to hit and it will be tough. Um, but again, and you will know this because we've done an exercise around this in the diploma, I often ask people, to share something for two minutes with somebody else, something you've achieved you're really proud of. Um, and as you know, we do that exercise and it links to strengths. But the secondary component of that exercise that I always end up saying to people is that thing you're really proud of. Were you at position A and then you decided to achieve something and bang, you just achieved it? No, the thing you're proud of, you got hit by adversity. There were obstacles. It was difficult. You had to persist. You had to keep getting up. And I think that's, again, what we forget, that positive psychology is also about having the tools to, to handle things, to get up and to keep going so that 10 years from now, after the recession is passed and whatever, you go, do you know what? We did an amazing job there. Cool. If someone's like, right, OK, cool. What could I do to start um, work, you know, working on my emotional intelligence? Because it is something, a skill we can develop and so mm. on. It's not you know, set and that's it. Um, what's a highly practical thing that we can do? A really good question. And this is the thing you can get very practical with this. So uh, a couple of things that I often say to start with is um, perceiving emotions. So uh, think about yourself. Can you stop and notice how you're feeling now and again? And one of the reasons in the diploma you would have done this assignment, we ask people to fill in the mood meter app and basically, not, you know, jot down periodically throughout the day, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on for me. So just being more aware and noticing your physiology, noticing that you've been holding your breath for the last five minutes, noticing your tense through your shoulders or your stomach's churning or whatever, you, and not just because you're hungry. Um, but actually <laughs> noticing that and being more aware, because ironically, when you get better at perceiving emotions in yourself, you actually tend to get better at perceiving them in others. So that would be my first one is always start with you your own awareness of how you're feeling, what's going on, and how is it impacting you? The other thing I would say, which is a really useful, simple one, is perceiving emotions in others, is watch people's faces. You know, we know from the research that you will have involuntary microexpressions around emotions. Watch them, pay attention. And too often, if we're in a face-to-face -face meeting, people are making notes or on their devices or whatever, you are not actually looking at somebody. 
Same as virtual. You can see these things if you just look. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And actually, again, this morning, and this happens often for me, uh, this morning there was somebody on the group. Um, I was watching the cameras and there was a little frown on her face when I said something. And I said, um, Joe, you've got a question. She went, oh, yeah, I do. But it's only because I was watching. So I think, again, as a leader, um, and particularly in sales with your, you know, if you're trying a, a new customer, et cetera, pay attention because their face will give them away if they're uncertain about what you've just said. Now, finally, before you leave us, don't forget to subscribe so that you always are the first to get your hands on our latest podcast as it's released.